Hi, Dan Hartman here, the Regional Medical Director for NEMG's Walk-In Clinics. Uh, in today's talk, I'm going to discuss the two uh, rapid point-of-care testing for COVID-19 that will soon become available to us at NEMG. Uh, the two tests are Safiyad's reverse transcriptase PCR test called the Expert Express and Thynex Now's rapid antigen lateral flow test. And I think it's very important for us to uh, understand uh, each of these tests in some detail, uh, how they're done, what the data is on them, so that we can make uh, informed decisions on uh, which test to order and how to interpret the results. So first I'm gonna discuss Safiyad's Expert Express test, which is a polymerase chain reaction test. And actually very similar to the gold standard tests that are currently being run in all the hospital laboratories. Uh, and it, you will see it referred to as RT-PCR, which is reverse transcriptase PCR, because the first step in this test is, uh, since it's an RNA virus, we have to first get a complementary DNA strand on that RNA uh, strand, and that's done by the enzyme reverse transcriptase. That's why it's called RT-PCR. But the basic principle behind uh, all polymerase chain reactions is that we have a uh, small segment of DNA that we've identified as being very specific to the virus in question. And the polymerase chain reaction test multiplies that small strand in an exponential fashion uh, in each cycle. And here's a picture of the, the green target fragment that we're interested in multiplying. And again, with each cycle that we run in PCR testing, we're multiplying just that fragment in an exponential fashion. And so after each cycle, it's uh, this formula, uh, two to the n power minus two n, where n is the amount of cycles, uh, that is the amount of copies of the desired fragment that are produced. After 10 cycles, for example, we have over a thousand copies of the desired fragment and only 20 copies of the DNA that we don't want. After 16 cycles, for example, we have 63,000 copies of the DNA that we want. That actually should be a comma here. This is a European slide. And only 32 copies of the DNA that we don't want. And after 30 cycles, we have over a billion copies made of the target DNA, while only 60 of the DNA that we don't want are copied. And eventually we amplify it enough so that we can actually see it. And the amount of cycles it takes to actually see it is called the cycle threshold or C little t. And as we finally hit a cycle threshold of around 19, we can actually finally start to see the fragment in question. And the reason we can see it, by the way, is because we attach a fluorescent probe onto a part of the DNA fragment in, in question, uh, and that allows us to see the fluorescence and now is referred to as a real-time quantitative uh, PCR test. So Safiyad's Expert Express test is a way of doing polymerase chain reaction testing very quickly and they have made it into a point of care test and the first question of course that they had to answer was how well does the test perform and that this is what is known as analytic sensitivity of the test and i've uh, purposely put that in in red as you as we will see uh, uh, soon that there's a big difference between analytic sensitivity and real world sensitivity but in the terms of analytic sensitivity, we see that it does very well. This, is, this column here is the positive percent agreement, uh, and they tested the Safiyad's Expert Express test against all these other uh, fancy hospital-based uh, PCR testing and found that it's uh, percent positive agreement, which you could think of for now as sensitivity, is somewhere between 92.3 and 100%. Well, no test in medicine is perfect, and despite the amazing technology behind PCR testing, we've learned from experience thus far that uh, analytic sensitivity does not at all equate with real-world clinical sensitivity. And to quote uh, this uh, Dr. Yohei from the College of American Pathologists, uh, she writes, uh, analytic performance of many of the SARS diagnostic PCR tests approaches 100% at 500 to 5,000 copies per milliliter, which are you know, very, very tiny concentrations of virus. However, clinical performance of testing depends on biologic and pre-analytic factors and only approaches 80% sensitivity and 98 to 99% specificity.
And the reasons for, for this are, you know, what you can imagine. Uh, variability in specimen collection technique is probably the most important factor. Uh, there's also storage issues and transportation of the specimen issues and really just all the, you know, the, the realities of the real world that contribute to the differences in what the laboratories report as their analytic sensitivity and what we actually see in real world clinical life. And China was first to report on the imperfections of PCR testing uh, in this first reference here published in May. This was on their hospitalized patients and they found that uh, nasal swabs, uh, in fact, were only about 63% sensitive. Um, and in the second reference, this is a New England Journal of Medicine article published in August. This was a review article where they had examined other studies currently being done and suggested that the sensitivity rate was approximately 70%. Uh, and these were obviously uh, rather disconcerting uh, numbers for our uh, uh, test that's considered the gold standard. But more recently, we have uh, some more data that's not quite as uh, depressing, I guess. This, uh, this meta-analysis was just published uh, a few weeks ago from uh, some Argentinian authors. Uh, they put together 37 studies from around the world that uh, was looking at the sensitivity of PCR testing for COVID-19. And you see in this column here, these are the false negative rates. So the top one has a false negative rate of 2%, which means the sensitivity is 98%. And you see this uh, quite a bit of variability. Here's a false negative rate of 33%, translating to a sensitivity of 67%. And down here, we even see false negative rate of 57%, translating to a sensitivity of 43%. Again, a very wide range of sensitivities, which is very typical of what we find in these in the studies that examine sensitivity uh, of PCR testing for COVID-19. Um, overall, when they put everything together and did their calculations, they found that the that the uh, total sensitivity uh, was 87%, which again is uh, not what we had hoped for our gold standard test, but maybe not as bad as what we thought it had been. And another great study came out fairly recently from Israel where they had fairly large numbers. They had um, uh, about 8,000 patients who were repeatedly tested. They were suspicious of having COVID, so they were repeatedly tested, and they ended up with about 30,000 tests. Um, and in the results, they found uh, that they had an overall false negative rate of 22.8%, again, which would be a sensitivity of about uh, 77%. Um, they also found, and this, uh, even more importantly, that the number of days from the day of diagnosis was positively correlated with false negative results with an odds ratio of about two for samples taken at a 15 at day 15 compared to samples taken at day zero which means that um, the chance of you having a false negative test was twice as great if you waited 15 days uh, from when the symptoms started and they published this excellent graph which i think is very very important uh, for us in the clinical world uh, in the top graph, you see uh, day zero. Day zero is defined in their study as the day the symptoms started. And you see the false negative rate was about 10% in the first five days of symptoms. And then the false negative rate starts going up beyond day five or day six of when the symptoms have started. Um, and again, so that translates to a sensitivity that's 90% in the first few days of the symptoms, but gets significantly worse beyond then. And this was very similar to the article that had been published in May by the Annals of Internal Medicine that um, caused such consternation when we first read it. Uh, in this study, the, uh, the broken line here is the, the day that the symptoms start, uh, which they defined as around day five. They presume that there's a five-day incubation, incubation period. So symptoms start at this day, and, then you, and, and again, on the y-axis is the, um, the false negative rate. So you can see that the best time to test people is about day one, two, three, or four after the symptoms start, when the false negative rate is about 20%. So they discovered that the best sensitivity we have is about 80% for PCR testing when you get it in that zone of zero to three or four days. The, the disconcerting part was here, the people that were in the uh, pre-symptomatic phase had a false negative rate of 100% close to 100%. Um, and um, I, I, it's, I guess it's important to keep in mind that this study excluded people who 
remained asymptomatic. So it only had people who uh, were asymptomatic and then became symptomatic. So we don't know if this translates to people that never become symptomatic. Uh, nonetheless, uh, we learned from this that we should probably only be testing people when their symptoms start. So how do we put all this together? Um, it's actually rather difficult and we just can do the best we can. And putting all the data together from all the uh, studies that I presented, we can, we can make a best guess and decide that the sensitivity of our gold standard test, the PCR testing, is somewhere between 60 and 90 percent. And that's a wide range and unfortunately that's the best we have. But we do know that it's definitely best to test people within the first five days that their symptoms develop. Well, the problem with uh, PCR testing is that it's inherently a quantitative test. And unfortunately, it's reported to us, the clinicians, as either positive or negative. What the test is actually uh, telling us is what is the cycle threshold that we are able to detect these virus particles? Were, were there was it a high concentration so we could detect them at 20 cycles? Or was it a very, very low concentration where we could only detect them at 40 cycles? Uh, this is actually very important for us, the clinicians, to know. But unfortunately, the results are only reported as positive or negative. It's the laboratory companies themselves are able to decide what the cutoff should be for a positive or negative. This is not dictated by the FDA or the World Health Organization. It's dictated by the laboratory company. So we're kind of left at the mercy of the, of the lab to tell us when these tests are positive or negative, when they should be actually telling us the level, of the cycle threshold, so we can decide uh, the relevance of, of that. And that problem is illustrated by uh, this next slide. Uh, on the x-axis here, we have the cycle threshold. And on the y-axis, we have the percent culture positive. So they actually cultured the virus and found out which specimens truly cultured positive. And everything's fine in the low cycle threshold level here, you know, 20 to 25, they're all culture positive. But once you get above, say, uh, 28 or 29, you see the percent that are culture positive is less than half. And as you get up to 35 cycles, almost none of them cultured positive. So what is the significance? of doing many, many, many cycles and finding uh, uh, the fragments after doing that many cycles when the culture, uh, the actual viral cultures are gonna be negative and the patients are likely not to be infectious. In this slide, uh, the y-axis has the um, cycle threshold going from lower to higher. So the x-axis has the days from the onset of symptoms. The blue dots are the virus culture positive. And you see the virus culture positive are mostly in the lower cycle threshold. Once you get above 30, 35 cycles, then everything are, most of the specimens are black dots, meaning that they're culture negative and probably are not infectious. And the same is true with days after the symptoms start. Once you get beyond say 10 days or when the symptoms start, you see non, you see culture negative viruses. And so again, it brings up the point of what is the significance of finding a positive result when you do many, many cycles. This is Yale's data on hospitalized patients from last March. And you see that the vast majority of people had cycle thresholds between 16 and 30. Very few had cycle thresholds greater than 30. And again, it's the specific laboratory that determines what the cutoff threshold is. Here's Safiad, which makes the, this is the gene expert, the one done in the hospitals, and our uh, Expert Express, you see that uh, it's, it's a very high uh, threshold cutoff. This is from the uh, package insert of the Expert Express test specifically. And you see here, they're running cycles of 45 um, again, very high. And this is also from the uh, uh, Expert Express uh, package insert. Uh, the PCR test is actually testing for uh, two uh, proteins, the nucleocapsid protein and an envelope protein. And the Safiad has decided that if uh, nucleic 
nucleocapsid protein is detected, whether or not envelope protein is detected is considered a positive test. And this is also controversial. And this controversy was published in, uh, in October in the, the Lancet Global Health, uh, where they compared the Safiad PCR test uh, against the World Health Organization's gold standard PCR test, the Da'an gene test uh, from China. And this is a quote from the article. When looking at the cycle threshold values from the gene expert assay, we observed that specimens with no ampli amplification of the E gene and cycle threshold values for the N2 gene greater than 40 cycles were considered as positives, whereas they were negative using the other PCR system. And so the issue of false positives or specificity of the PCR test is very controversial. Um, you can see a bunch of opinions uh, on this. And the reason it's very controversial is because just inherent in the test itself, you know, disregarding all the things that can occur like transportation issues and uh, contamination issues, just inherent in the test itself, we have the possibility of false positives or positive results that are meaningless. Uh, this came out in the Lancet in September. Uh, they estimated that the uh, a false positive rate was somewhere between 0.8 and 4.0%. The study agreed with that and found actually a wide range. Uh, the false positive rate may range from 0 to 16%, uh, and they grabbed the interquartile range of 0.8 to 4.0%. These folks decided that specificity was 80%. That was published in October in Lancet Global Health. So just like we did for sensitivity, there's little more we can do uh, for specificity other than taking an educated guess. And we know that the specificity uh, based on the data is somewhere between 80 and 96%. And I'm just gonna be optimistic and call it 94% for really for no apparent reason, but that's the best we can do is just take an educated guess at it, knowing what the range is. So let's summarize what we know about PCR testing. Um, and again, first is sensitivity. And just to remind you that sensitivity means that if you have the disease, the chance that you will have a positive test. And as, as I've discussed, it's quite a wide range. And all we know is that sensitivity is somewhere between 60 and 90%. So let's just assume that we're, we're doing the right thing, I guess, and testing between uh, day one and five of symptoms, we can then be somewhat optimistic and call sensitivity 86%. Again, this is just a, 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 a guess that we can use for purposes of, of our clinical judgment and uh, post-test probabilities later on. Uh, for specificity, again, there's, there's a rather wide range um, and we don't know for sure. So we're going to say 94%, uh, and which again is op being optimistic. Well, now it's time to talk about the Binex Now rapid antigen test, also called the lateral flow assay. Uh, this is a much simpler test than the PCR testing. Uh, it's the test that we're very familiar with. It's run on a little card, very similar to the strep test that we've been doing for many years. And this is an excellent depiction of how this test is done. Uh, the analyte, that's your sample, which may have antigen present. Um, in the nitrocellulose membrane, you have uh, a manufactured antibody that is hooked up with a yellow fluorescent marker. And if indeed there is antigen present, it pairs up with that antibody. Um, and that in turn uh, pairs up with another antibody. Um, and that's why it's, it's often referred to as sandwich ELISA. Um, and then of course, some of the, um, the uh, fluorescent marked uh, antibody comes through to the control line as well, so that you know you have a valid test. So if you do have antigen in your sample, you'll see the fluorescent band light up here in addition to the control band. Well, what do we know about the sensitivity and specificity of the Binax Now rapid antigen test? Um, this is a review article from the Cochrane Library that came out in September. Uh, they evaluated eight studies, uh, all rapid antigen ELISA tests. Unfortunately, none of the, none of the studies used the Binax Now test specifically so this is data on similar tests from other companies. Uh, they found that the sensitivity was 56.2% and the specificity was 99.5%. So sensitivity of 56.2 means lots of false negatives. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, specificity, very few false positives. 
And this is the literature on the Binax Now test specifically. This is the FDA's uh, emergency use authorization literature. Um, and, and this was what was reported to the FDA by the Binax Now company. And you have to look down the column and you see that there is a positive agreement of 84.6%. Again, you can think of that as sensitivity. It's really not sensitivity and we shouldn't be calling it that because remember that sensitivity means that the chance that if you have the disease, you will have a positive test. Well, we really don't know if people have the disease because we really don't have a good gold standard. So all we can say is positive percent agreement. Those that have a positive test that agree with the comparator method, whatever that would be. So we can say that the positive percent agreement or sort of the sensitivity of the Binax now, or at least the Binax now compared to a PCR test is 84.6%. The negative agreement, which you can think of as specificity, is better at 98.5%. And so a reasonable guess is that the sensitivity of this test is about 65%, and the specificity of this test is about 98.5%. Um, but remember that we're not really talking about sensitivity and specificity with this rapid antigen test. We're talking about uh, percent positive agreement and percent negative agreement. So we should actually say that the percent positive agreement is 65%. But 65% of what? Well, we, de we decided that our gold standard sensitivity was 86%. So it's actually 65% of 86%, which is 55%, is our sensitivity of the rapid antigen test in real life. Specificity is much better. We said our, our, our percent negative agreement is 98.5%. And we said that the specificity of our gold standard is 96%, so it's actually 98.5% of 96%, which is pretty good at 93%. So here's the final summary. Our expert express PCR fancy test has a sensitivity probably about 86%, assuming we test within the first few days of symptoms, and a specificity of 94%, which yields a positive likelihood ratio which is sensitivity over one minus the specificity of 14.3, which is pretty good, and a negative likelihood ratio, which is one minus the sensitivity over the specificity of 0.15, which is okay. The Binax Now rapid antigen test has a sensitivity of 55%, lots of false negatives, a specificity that's good, a positive likelihood ratio of 7.9, which is okay, and a negative likelihood ratio of 0.48, which is useless. And remember that the likelihood ratios are very, very helpful to us in the clinical world. Um, if you like me, you then use this thing called the Bayes nomogram. Uh, or if you're more hip, you can uh, just go online and get a calculator here. Uh, but you take your pretest probability of disease, you then draw a line through your likelihood ratio, and you end up with your post-test probability of disease, or you just plug your numbers in uh, to the calculator there. And so here are the results. And, and this is a slide that I really want you to, I guess, take home with you, um, uh, do a screenshot of this and print it out or whatever, um, uh, because I'm hoping that'll be very, very helpful in your clinical decisions. And uh, you can see that if your pretest probability of disease is very low, meaning that after you've seen the patient and done your history and physical, and you know about the prevalence of the disease in your community, and you decided that the, before you do any tests, the chance of them having COVID-19 is only 10%, that uh, negative tests in both the uh, PCR and the rapid antigen tests are quite helpful. Uh, but a positive test, especially in the rapid antigen test, is not very helpful at all. Uh, due to the false positives, you're only up to a 47% chance of them actually having the disease. You're somewhat better if you have a positive PCR test. Um, and if you have a very high suspicion after seeing the patient, you know, everyone in the family has had COVID, the patient has the exact same symptoms, and you're pretty sure before you do the testing uh, that the patient has COVID. Well, a, a, a negative rapid antigen test does not help you at all. They still have a 66% chance of having the disease. You're somewhat better with a negative PCR test. And of course, you're fine with positive testing. And if you're not sure, if you're in the middle of the road somewhere, uh, positive testing in both tend to be pretty helpful. A negative rapid antigen test is not so helpful though. Uh, so again, take this slide with you and go uh, as we start doing more testing uh, for COVID-19. Um, I think and hope it'll be uh, very helpful to you. Well, thank you very much for listening and I hope that clears up some of the confusion uh, about uh, COVID-19 testing.
and please uh, email me with uh, any questions you have at all. I will get back to you, I promise.